May the warp be with you, Star Wars slash Warhammer 40k fanfiction. By Ilark in the Dark. Warning this fiction contains. Graphic violence. Profanity. Sensitive content. It is a long time ago, in a galaxy, far far away. For more than nine centuries, the Galactic Republic has been ever expanding, yet all is not well. The Republic is a rotting carcass, corrupted through and through. The Ecumenopolis of Coruscant is the jeweled throne upon which the Republic sits, yet it too is just another hive world of scum and villainy. Even the Jedi Temple of Coruscant is becoming internally divided on the matter of petty politics. And soon, it will become worse. Forget the promises of peace and compromise, for in the grim dark past there is no peace amongst the stars, only a temporary reprieve from the nightmare of abominations during which the laughter of the Sith, who have been planning and waiting for a moment just like this, can be heard. You, a former navigator of the novice Nobilite, the navigator houses for the Imperium of Man, have been born anew in an unfamiliar world. But you do not know your future, nor your past. You will have to relearn the tools of your previous glories as well as explore the mysteries of the Force. Good luck, and may the warp be with you. Prologue The crowded streets of the sprawling city of Coruscant are not known to be a quiet place. This night is no exception. The wailing of sirens and murmur of distant conversations can be heard even by the guards at the main entrance of the Jedi Temple, which sits separated from the city proper by a respectable distance and several flights of stairs. The guards remain alert, ready to perform their duty, should any foolish intruders attempt to force their way through the doors. A flock of tranter pigeons takes to the sky, screeching madly with fear. Creatures of both diurnal and nocturnal species bolt away into the night. In their wake, they leave a disquieting silence. The temple guards are startled, but only grip their weapons tighter and increase their vigilance in response. Their captain's hand lingers by his communicator, ready to call in backup should anything assault the temple. In their guts, the guards feel a pervasive, uncomfortable sensation. A child's cry pierces the silence. It's distressingly close by. With a gesture, the captain tasks two guards to investigate. They find an infant lying in the center of the main path, swaddled in the remains of an unfamiliar military uniform. The child gurgles in its sleep, having fallen back into peaceful slumber. One guard keeps watch, wary for further strange phenomena, while the other carefully retrieves the infant. As it is lifted from its cloth nest, the guards can get a better look at it, and it becomes clear that it's a girl, and she is clearly inhuman. She appears almost like a baseline human, and is certainly human-like, but the child has what appears to be a third eye in the center of its forehead. Neither of the guards have seen a species exactly like this. Of course, there are many examples of humanoids with three eyes, but this particular specimen is unfamiliar. Hopefully, the child is force-sensitive, for it will be easier to find acceptance for its strange appearance within the Jedi Temple than without. Circling the child's head is what appears to be an adjustable metal headband, shifted off angle in the child's sleep. The front of the headband expands out and tapers down into a triangular shape. A set of three squashed diamonds adorn the piece, vertically offset as if in a geometric hierarchy. The emblem of an open eye rests inside the centermost, glaring out at the world, ever watchful. The guards reach out to collect the strange clothing, but reveal more to the mystery. Out of the clothing drops an unusual ornament, depicting a double-headed bird of prey, wings spread as if in flight. The bird sits upon a strange piece of machinery that the guards cannot identify the shape of which suggests that this ornament sat atop a larger item. The child and its swaddling is gathered up and taken through the main entrance of the temple. A preliminary inspection is all well and good, but it would do to leave the child in the care of the temple's medical staff for the night. Stepping into the medical wing, Jedi Knight Bren Masbo begins explanations to the staff while his fellow guard for the night, Part 1 Lon, rushes away to make inquiries with Coruscant security about a missing child. Hopefully the child can be reunited with a loving family, but if the family is either non-existent or unloving, other steps will need to be taken. 
Thankfully, the Jedi on duty in the medical wing is still awake and quickly makes arrangements for a closer inspection of the child. The child is placed onto the medical table and the strange clothing and accessories are stored for later investigation. The child shivers slightly in the slightly chilly air of the room and arrangements are made to have clothing prepared. The healer and his assistants perform a perfunctory medical examination, confirming that the child is in reasonably good health, despite its circumstances. Not only that, but a test for force sensitivity is performed and it appears that the child does in fact bear some spark. Even merely holding the hand of the child and manipulating a wisp of the force results in a flare of emotion from the child, a clear sign that the child can feel the force intrinsically. The child's appearance is rather strange according to the medic. There is no known species that shares all the child's physical traits. The most standout feature is her tail, shaped like that of a scorpion's. The child unconsciously curls it around herself in her sleep, causing the medics to fear that she will accidentally pierce herself with the stinger. However, it appears that the stinger itself is dulled. Either someone has filed away at the sharp point for safety reasons, or it has simply not matured to the point of becoming a perpetually on-hand, tail, weapon. Scans reveal that despite the frightfully scorpion-like appearance of the appendage, the child does not have any venom glands, and thus the tail will not be too much of a danger. Next, at the crown of the child's head sits two small nubs, the beginning of what could be horns. From the size of these, it is likely these will not grow to be much larger than that of a zabrak. The medics almost ended the examination here before noticing two other subtler features. Firstly, the child completely lacks any body hair. They had originally assumed that the baldness of the child's head and the lack of eyebrows simply meant that someone had shaved these off for hygiene, but closer inspection of the child's skin reveals that the child lacks even the tiny hairs that would normally coat a human. Strangely enough, she does seem to retain her eyelashes and nasal hair both of which are the first line of defense in many humanoid species' eyes and nose. In order to avoid waking the child during the examination, the medics opted to wait until the end to check the child's vision. She appears to respond to optical stimuli well, but when the medics shut off the pen light, they noticed that her eyes seemed to keep sparkling as if they were reflecting the light of an icy blue sun. The same can be said of her third eye, though the medics become somewhat concerned when the lead examiner begins to stumble and clutch his chest after staring into her eye for just a few seconds. In fact, anybody who looks into her eye begins to feel nauseated, describing the sensation as being drowned in an endless sea of grasping hands. In the end, it is decided that the headband slash eye patch that the child was originally wearing should be returned to the child and locked in place. Despite the swift reactions of the guards and CORSEC, no family has been found to be missing a child matching this one's description. Given that she is Force-sensitive, it only makes sense to keep the child as a ward of the temple. As no name for the child is known, the medics decide to give her one so that they can at the very least put something on the medical records. And so, you were officially admitted as a Jedi initiate and were raised within the confines of the temple. You have had a good, albeit regimented childhood, so far. Every day is filled with learning and exercise, which you have done your best to apply yourself to. The temple staff, the instructors, the knights, and the masters that interact with you younglings have given their time and dedication to the nurturing of you and your fellow younglings. Of course, you are a child and have gotten into your share of mischief as you grew, playing harmless pranks on your friends, staying up past curfew running next to the temple pool, and more. Despite your childhood adventures, you have still been instilled with some modicum of discipline, meaning that you floss your teeth and do at least four of the five required meditations every day. This is where your story begins. Good luck, and may the warp be with you, one to one seeing the storm. Ten years later. It is almost never a rapid transition to full wakefulness. You balance upon that knife edge of slumber, in the peculiar state of near-dreaming consciousness that allows the creative mind to wander afar. For as long as you can remember, your mind has conjured up innocent and silly figments during this state, often immediately forgotten, but still leaving a fading imprint upon waking. The masters have always dismissed it easily, childish and harmless as it is. 
For the first time in your life, however, you experience something different. You see an enormous storm of indescribable color, stretched upon an intergalactic scale. Horror and wonder and fear and joy and a million emotions flicker through you. You instinctively flinch back and attempt to look away, but the storm surrounds you. Winding currents and protein gusts and unspeakable things with far too many teeth and eyes hurtle past. You attempt to scream, and something's attention turns to. The rumble of rain and thunder wakes you, dragging you violently into consciousness. Gasping and sobbing quietly, you clutch at your chest and look around to confirm that you still exist within reality. After a moment, you relax, body and brain aching as if you'd just spent a whole year climbing each of the temple's five spires. It is pouring outside. Daybreak has yet to begin, but the harsh lights of Coruscant's endless skyline are still capable of reaching your quarters, which you share with several other younglings. A glance at your roommates lets you know that you haven't disturbed their sleep. You sit upright, shutting your eyes and slowing your breaths, centering yourself as best as you can. Your heart's desperate pounding eventually calms to a steady beat. Warm tears trace their way down your cheeks. The next time you open your eyes, the room is bright with sunlight and rustling with the sounds of the other younglings, getting ready for the day. A gentle hand touches your shoulder. Zena, a voice asks. Are you all right? Looking to your left, you see Tara, your best friend. She's short, like you, well, you're all small at your age, but only she matches your diminutive stance, and her head boasts an impressive four leku uncommon, but not unheard of, for Twi'lex. She normally feels to you like a warm hug on a beautiful summer day, but right now she radiates the warm dark tang of concern and yellow cold song of fear. You can still sense her true self beneath, but her emotions scream outwards at you. Why yes, you stammer. Why? What is it? You have blood on your face, she whispers. You hesitantly wipe at your face and your fingers come away with flecks of dried blood. A small mirror is pushed into your hand, which you use to examine yourself. True enough, there are two lines of crimson brown running downwards from the corners of your eyes. You lick a finger and begin to rub at the streaks. I'm fine, you say. Getting up, you quickly dress for the day. Your clothes are the same as most other initiates, a light tunic, a slightly thicker robe-like outer layer, a cloth belt to bind it together, pants, and soft brown boots. Finally, you check your headband to ensure it's fit, then head out for breakfast. An initiate's day consists of meditation, practice with the force, meditation, classes, meditation, physical training, and more meditation. Every day, apart from holidays, provides a structured routine for initiates to follow. As you perform your morning meditation, you attempt, as always, to center yourself and find yourself in the Force. Everybody's connection to the Force is different, as the Masters say. To some, it is like submerging in a pool and feeling the currents and ripples flow around and through oneself. To others, it is simply just there. But to you, the force feels like a blanket, wrapped around you. Sometimes, it is a comfort, warm and welcoming. You feel safe and surrounded by the presence of the force, and you are able to push at the membrane surrounding you in order to feel others around you. Manipulation of anything outside the blanket is still difficult but doable, whether it be to move a physical object or touch the mind of another person. It feels like, well, trying to grab onto something while hampered by a thick piece of cloth. You can grasp for things, but you do not yet have the strength or dexterity to wrap your mind around them. However, the blanket sometimes feels smothering. There is too much to feel at once, too much pressure from all around you. Pushing it away simply makes it worse, as it reveals that the blanket is not so much a discreet piece of cloth draped upon you, but more of a tightened body bag in which you are confined. It is all around you, and the exit cannot be found. The days when it feels like this are the worst. It is all you can do to power through the day. You would likely lose sleep to it if you weren't so exhausted from pushing yourself all day. The masters say that the force fills everything in the universe. You are one with it and it is one with everything. If that is the case, then why do you feel the weight of the force like a blanket? 
should it not flow through you, instead of around you, as it does through everybody else? Oh, your connection with the Force is not in question. You are able to complete all the tasks and little games the Masters assign to you. It is only your age that is holding you back from the tougher exercises. You have relayed your concerns to your Masters in the past, but as far they can tell, your connection with the Force is just as strong as that of your peers, which makes you wonder even more about why you cannot experience it as deeply. And your seeming inability to feel its presence within you seems to be unfounded, as the Masters are able to sense it spiraling within you. This session of meditation, however, does not reveal the reasoning behind your troubles. You try to meditate as usual, but end up pondering your dream from last night. What is the meaning of the storm? What were the creatures that you glimpsed? The experience felt like it only lasted a second, but all that you saw fills up your mind for the rest of the meditation session. It is only the quiet warning that force lessons are about to start that causes you to break out of your thoughts. Your lesson for today involves the manipulation of small toys through the force. It is a simple exercise of stacking objects, which is typically a task that much younger initiates can do. This causes muttered complaints from some of the other initiates, but they are silenced when the instructor gives them a harsh glare. The instructor, Jedi Knight Part 1 Lon, then sighs and explains that despite the apparent simplicity and tedium of the task, continuous practice only makes a student better. An obvious statement, but she continues on by producing a timer and having every initiate in the room repeat the task faster and faster until everyone feels exhausted. Your performance is slightly above average for the group. You're able to stack all the given toys available in a rather haphazard way, but you put just enough care into the task that even though you went slowly and dropped a few toys, you never knocked over your whole tower. Perhaps today is a good day after all? You attempt another meditation session just before you break for lunch, but you end up thinking about your dream once again and essentially accomplishing nothing. Lunch is a simple fare, just some grains and proteins. You spend some time talking with Tara and a couple other clanmates, and then it is off again to classes. Early afternoon classes consist of galactic history, language, culture, and, of most interest lately, politics. Unlike in your force lessons, you typically do rather well in these courses. You apply yourself fully to the topics you are interested in, and only slightly less so to the topics you are not. Today's lesson plan is focused around the, relatively, recent political history of the Naboo crisis. Nine years ago, the planet of Naboo was blockaded by the Trade Federation. The whole thing was caused by a mess of political and economic disputes. Fortunately, for the Queen of Naboo at the time, the late Master Kagan Jin and his apprentice, Obi-Wan Kenobi, were in the right place at the right time to swoop in and save the day, which probably would make a good holodrama. While the adventures of your fellow Jedi offer a good incentive to keep the other younglings engaged, you do make sure to try and untangle the threads of the story that brought about the entire dispute in the first place. From what you can make out from the instructor's lectures and your own readings of the event, much of the chaos could be traced back to the rise of the Nebula Front within the Trade Federation. Led by Newt Gunray, the Nebula Front was heavily against both the corporate conglomerates and the Galactic Republic. After the mysterious deaths of multiple Trade Federation leaders, later discovered to be assassinations, Newt Gunray ascended to Viceroy of the Trade Federation. Under his leadership, the Trade Federation gained enough, fire, power to launch a blockade of Naboo, citing the raising of taxes by Chancellor Valorum as the final straw. All of this is preceded by even more complicated economic history, primarily involving taxes and wealth inequality between the inner core and the outer rim of the Galactic Republic. Your studies of the Naboo crisis are ended abruptly as the class is dismissed. Perhaps you will come back to this later. For now, it is time for a brief break, and then on to physical training. One to two pillars of the force. Xena. You look up as Tara walks up behind you. You had again been contemplating the dream you had last night. It continuously pervades your thoughts and you can't help but feel drawn back to it during quiet moments. You have heard that dreams are often filled with symbolism regarding current events in your life and can often be interpreted in some meaningful way. 
You've been focusing on the storm you'd seen, turning the vision around and around in your mind. You would think that a storm could symbolize turmoil in your life, but nothing has happened recently that could cause you that much concern. Perhaps it symbolizes your connection to the Force? However, it doesn't match your normal experiences with the Force. Additionally, why would you be feeling a storm-like disturbance in the temple? Here, the Force feels calm, as peaceful and quiescent as the surface of the temple pool. There are significantly fewer people within the temple than without, and those that are here are mostly knights and masters who contribute to the maintenance of an oasis of peace. Xena. Let's go. We'll be late. You jerk out of your thoughts. Tara's spiky bright hum of impatience draws you to your feet and you begin your walk to the training yard. As you go, you listen to her chatter on with excitement and anticipation. The two of you, along with a good portion of other younglings, have been told that you are nearly ready to take the initiate trials, and she obviously cannot wait, running on with hypotheticals about what you may or may not face during the trials, and who your eventual masters could be. You can't help but be excited as well, drawn into the pure anticipation that she radiates. Passing the initiate trials will make you eligible to become a Padawan learner. As a Padawan, you will finally be able to leave the temple and explore the galaxy. But, then again, whenever you left the temple in the past, on chaperone day trips and the like, you always couldn't help but feel overwhelmed. So many people. So many thoughts and emotions and souls around you that you could barely tell who was who and what was what. It was all that you could do to parse out your own self from the crowd, perhaps staying in the temple would be better. All the other younglings radiate dark red derision when speaking of the alternative, joining the service corps, but it cannot be that bad. After all, nurturing crops, healing, teaching, exploring, these don't sound too bad. It's honest work, and best of all, you likely wouldn't have to be around so many people if you were to join any one of the service corps branches. If you are unable to master yourself and find some way of suppressing the deluge of thoughts and emotions of other beings, then this would be a viable career that you may even come to enjoy. So long as you can survive the shame of failing the initiate trials, that is. Physical training is taught by an off-duty Jedi Temple guard today. Master Masbo strides across the room as the students perform their warm-up exercises, lecturing as he goes. The three pillars consist of the force, knowledge, and self-discipline. Every one of you has built a foundation for each pillar at this point, and it is my responsibility to help you build up from there. Keep each of these in your mind throughout today's lesson and form connections between each pillar and your actions. This morning, you practiced with the force. Remember, just like with muscles, the more you practice, the stronger you get. With the Force, your connection will continuously get stronger. Whenever you get the chance, you must practice. Even simple telekinetic exercises like the one that Night Lawn had you perform this morning will reveal their necessity given time. However, remember that the Force is not a toy. Do not play with it. Do not abuse it. As an initiate, you have learned about the aspect of the Force called control. Control is centered around your own body. The force exists in everything, including your body. Develop your control and you will always understand what your body can do, and how it can do better. Master it, and you will master yourself. You will build upon your knowledge and your connection with the force as you progress through each of the three aspects of the force, control, sense, and alter. During our exercises, allow the force to flow through you. Open your mind to it for it will never lead you astray when it comes to your own body. At this, you feel a bit of frustration. Your inability to sense the force within you continuously hampers you. Why can't you do it? You have always been able to sense the emotions of others, an ability that the masters say is rather rare, and is a relatively advanced technique for someone of your age, yet you cannot even perform the most basic of tasks. At this rate, it's even possible that you could be held back from the initiate trials. But, this isn't the time to panic. You calm yourself with a quick breath, then continue on with your stretches as Master Masbo finishes up his monologue. Form good habits throughout your life. Here, we help by structuring each day around the pillars, 
but once you lead the life of an initiate, you will have to keep up your practices by yourself. Your master will do their best to assist you, but remember that it is your own responsibility to yourself to ingrain these tenets within you. After all, once you've graduated from Padawan tonight, you will often have no one but yourself. No one to guide your connection to the Force, no one to teach you about our galaxy. And worst of all, no one to tell you how to exercise well. Now, everybody gather around. We're going to start our run in a moment. The two other aspects of the Force, Sense, and Altar, are supposedly out of the reach of the majority of initiates. It is expected that younglings like yourself build up from control, then learn sense as a Padawan, and alter as a knight. You, however, naturally have the ability to sense other beings around you. When you were much younger, you had assumed that everybody else was able to do the same, with this thought only reinforced by the fact that your minders seemed to share this ability with you. You believed that other younglings simply didn't pay attention to each other's feelings, too young and immature to care. It was only later, after a tantrum in which you screamed your frustrations out at another youngling for not sharing a toy, that you learned from the caretaker that this was not a common ability. Thinking back to it, it is clear that the reason why your menders could sense emotion was because they were knights and masters who had volunteered for, or been assigned the task of taking care of younglings due to their capability in sensing emotions. You have tried to learn more about sense, but have made little progress. Your instructors indulge your curiosity most of the time, but always advise you to master control first. Unfortunately, it seems that you are only able to sense the presence, emotions, and true self of others at this time. You still lack the capability to sense more of the environment around you. After your run, Master Masbo leads the class through the various forms of lightsaber combat. Most of the instructors, like Master Masbo, focus on Form 6, Nyman, but you at least know the basics of the other five basic forms. It is only Form 7, Vapad, and the unnumbered Jar Kai that you are unfamiliar with, what with one being banned and the other requiring the use of two sabers. You aren't the best with lightsaber combat, but you do your best to keep up with the class. Your lack of height, and therefore lack of reach, often causes you to fall into the defensive. Fortunately, the form you are most familiar with, Nyman, is mostly balanced with a slight emphasis on defensive fighting. Additionally, while Nyman relies heavily on the use of force powers in its application, most of the use of the force is applied away from your body, generally to disrupt your opponent in some manner. Aside from Form 6, the form you are next most familiar with is Form 4, Adaru, the aggressive form. Many Jedi see this form as barbaric or overly aggressive. What place does such an aggressive combat style have in a peaceful galaxy? Jedi are peacekeepers, not assault troops. Yet despite the stigma, you have pursued this form in order to negate your shortcomings for being on the smaller side. Through a flurry of quick and decisive blows, you can, in theory, force an opening and finish your opponent. 1-3 to three Redirection Master Masbo is a familiar face to you. Having been the first to find you when you were left at the temple, he has taken to visiting you occasionally in your creche to check on your well-being. Despite him being rather brusque in his speech, his true self shines through when you look at him, showing you how he truly cares for you, and all the other younglings. This is perhaps why he takes his job as a temple guard so seriously, having elected to continue as a guard after ascending to Jedi Master. And so, you always take his instruction to heart even with the somewhat harsh words he uses. When he realized that you were too passive in combat, he recommended Adaru to you in order to get you to show more aggression. Your passivity had resulted in you being pushed into the defensive too often, and your lack of strength allowed your opponents to simply bat your lightsaber aside, leaving you wide open. Despite the negative connotations associated with Adaru, Master Masbo recognized its possible use in shoring up your weaknesses. With your small stature, you have to get in much closer than normal to engage your opponent. And, in doing so, you are able to force your opponent into a much tighter position than they are perhaps familiar with, giving you the advantage. Even your lack of strength is less consequential for in such close quarters your opponents will rarely have the leverage to utilize their superior strength. 
Additionally, quick blade work on your part does not need so much strength behind it, for your opponent must always contest your attacks lest they be run through. After all, a blow from a lightsaber is never glancing unless your opponent wears specialized armor. However, one weakness of Adaru is its performance against blasters. Oh, it still works just fine, but it will never match Jem, so in defending against projectiles. Unfortunately, neither is Nyman as good as Jem so, and so when Master Masbo announces to the class that you will next be doing bolt blocking practice, you feel a sliver of apprehension. And, it is not just your favorite form's lesser performance against projectiles that concerns you. When Master Masbo releases the training droids into the air, you grimace and grip your training saber just a bit tighter. For some reason, droids have always seemed uncanny. Their capability for thought, speech, action, it all seems at odds with their existence. Many are able to act almost like a sapient, yet in your sight, they lack a true self. The true self of a person is often buried beneath their emotions, clouded behind a glow of feeling. A person's psyche is written upon their true self, declaring their desires, intentions, personality, and even secrets. You try not to look too hard at the last of these to allow others their privacy, but sometimes, it's just there. But, with droids, it is like looking at a cadaver, a dead thing, walking and talking, despite having no business doing so. When you look at a droid, it feels as if there should be something else there, and yet nothing shows through the metal shell. Hollow, despite the weave of circuitry and sensors. All the other younglings seem perfectly fine with the droids, excitedly getting ready for the exercise. This kind of exercise is a basic one that all younglings have done before, often one of the first exercises a youngling has been led through. Donning the vision-restricting helmet forces the initiate to become familiar with the Force. The Force guides the blade and gives the Jedi awareness beyond sight. Through this practice, a youngling learns to trust in the Force, their body, and their saber. As the training droid assigned to you floats its way over to your assigned zone, you feel your heart beat slightly faster and your breath catches in your throat. You shudder as you prepare, tying your blindfold in place, the standard helmet not fitting on your horned head, and do your best to center yourself. You calm your breathing, reach out to the force, and let go. Begin. In a matter of seconds, you block a dozen stunning bolts. The training droid darting all around you is a wisp in the force, its presence glimmering as it circles. You ignore the dead feeling it emanates, concentrating only on the guiding hand of the force, allowing your hands and feet to move where needed with little conscious direction. In this moment, you feel in control, at peace in the movement of your body, and able to ignore all the issues that have cluttered your mind over the day. You feel as if the force conforms to your body, not really weighing on you, but instead gently directing your body into just the right positions to either block or dodge bolts for the next few minutes. You know that it's seeping in and out of your body, flowing through your limbs as you dance through the exercise, even though you cannot feel it yourself. During this exercise, more care must be taken than usual, for though each initiate has their own assigned area to work in, there is not much overall space and there are no dividing walls. Careless initiates often step outside their zones, forcing others to dodge them in addition to the stunning bolts. Not only that, but reflected bolts are another major hazard. Customarily, the training sabers will absorb the low-energy bolts from the training droids, dissipating them when blocked. Today's exercise involves sabers that reflect the bolts, and it takes additional concentration to avoid sending the bolts at other initiates while you practice, and dodge bolts accidentally sent toward you. After another 15 minutes or so, Master Masbo calls a halt to the practice, allowing you to rest. You and many other initiates nearly collapse in exhaustion from the intensive workout. You are at least nursing far fewer bruises than your peers, having avoided or blocked nearly all of the bolts. Younger and less experienced initiates are doing slightly better, having had their training droids set on a lower difficulty. That'll be all for today, yells out Master Masbo. Return your equipment and clean yourselves up. Dinner will be available soon at the refectory. Good work. My hand still hurts. Xena, feed me. 
Tara opens her mouth expectantly, happily scrunching her eyes as you comply. Unfortunately for her, she hadn't done nearly as well in the exercise as you, having been hit in the dominant hand by a reflected bolt. She'd spent the rest of the exercise frantically dodging and trying to defend herself with her offhand, alternating between cursing and trying to shake the feeling back into her hand. Zena, you really shouldn't spoil her, says Doran, one of your other clanmates. She can just as easily eat with her other hand. It's not like she needs utensils to eat that. True, but she'll keep whining if I don't fill her face for her, you respond. Tara gives you a brief pout, but you can see the rise of bubbly purple mild amusement in her emotions. It grows even more purple as you feel a sharp jerk in your tail, and then hear a loud crashing sound right behind you. Ah. My food. Zena, you've got to watch where you put your tail. And you need to watch your step, nine. I tucked it as far beneath the seat as I could. I can't see your tail when my tray is blocking my vision, she complains. I'm going back to get more food. Help me clean that up and I'll forgive you. With that, Nine Adia starts walking back to the queue for food, grumbling under her breath. You roll your eyes and start picking up the food, gathering it onto the tray for ease. Thankfully, most of the food is of the dry variety and in large chunks, so you're not going to have to mop anything up. Nine is usually the calm type of person, but her sticky orange irritation marks a contrast with her usual self. You can't really blame her either, as you probably could have been a bit more careful with your tail. On the other hand, her irritation is mostly directed, again, at the bolt-blocking exercise. Nine is a perfectionist in her defense, but in the chaos of the exercise, she failed to deflect at least five bolts, each one striking her in her leku or her sensitive mantrals, both of which stuck out of the Tagruta version of the training helmet. In the meantime, Tara and Doran chat about the classes you had earlier in the afternoon. Neither of them are fans of the courses, despite the obvious necessity of them. To a Jedi, who keeps the peace throughout a galaxy of a million worlds and a million different cultures, understanding the economics, language, cultures, and politics of the people you meet is critical. Unfortunately, this doesn't stop your friends from complaining. Why does Master Shima assign so much work? We've got so much to read already on the Naboo crisis. Why is he having us do more reading on the Gungan holidays too? How's that even important? Well, the Gungans were pretty important in the conflict, you say. The Queen of Naboo was only able to get them on her side after appealing to both the peaceful and the militaristic sides of their culture. They're normally a peaceful kind of people, at least that's what the texts say, but they do have the remnants of a warrior culture from back when they were a tribal people. By reiterating that all she wanted was peace, Queen Amidala was able to at least calm the Gungan boss. She was then able to appeal to their sense of honor by virtually begging them to help in the retaking of Naboo. Doran is a bit surprised at this, evidently having focused more on the exploits of the Jedi during the lecture than on the major players in the conflict. But still, why holidays? You think for a second, then hazard a guess, maybe it's because of their festival of warriors? I don't know much about it, but it certainly sounds like something important for understanding their willingness to overcome their isolationist stance to fight for Naboo. Probably important for understanding their military doctrine too. All right, all right. You've got a point. You know, cultural studies is really really important. Misunderstandings between cultures are a major cause of many wars in our past, you remark. Sometimes, there are issues with basic greetings between cultures. Some cultures require you to meet the eyes of the one you're entreating in order to show proper respect. In others, it's a challenge for dominance and the correct greeting is to keep your eyes lowered. Understanding between people is so important. Take, for example, the Otsen Hendon incident. The Otsen are a historically pacifistic people. They would rather live and let live than fight. In a cutthroat galaxy, this doesn't exist very often, but the uniquely caustic atmosphere of their home planet essentially makes it untenable for anybody to try and take it from them. And, taking them as slaves or captives is more trouble than it's worth since their biology is suited only for their world, and nowhere else. 
the Hendon on the other hand, used to be far more militaristic. In their past, they were hunted by a great predator they call the Changer. They either overcame the Changer at some point, or it disappeared. It devolved into their boogeyman, hiding in the dark and ready to eat naughty children. But, their racial fear of the Changer caused them to be ever afraid of new people, for the Changer was said to be able to shapeshift into anybody, striking when least expected. The only way the Hendon could identify the Changer was its lack of specialized, cone-shaped organs atop its head. The Hendon utilized these organs to sense the flow of the force around their homeworld, seeing its currents in the upper atmosphere and using this to orient themselves. The Changer could not replicate these organs, and thus could be marked out. Once the Hendon discovered spaceflight, they built up their military and would make aggressive moves throughout the galaxy, though always avoided all-out war. It is fortunate that they never came across any Claudites or other shapeshifters before the formation of the Galactic Republic, or this story may be about a different incident entirely. Then, they came upon the Otsen. For some reason, they refused to acknowledge the Otsen. Not in interaction, but in their existence. They would not even say Otsen, and feigned confusion or ignorance when anybody talked to them. In the meantime, they were invading the Otsen's world in all but name, landing in their cities, walking through their homes, and taking whatever they wanted. Of course, the Otsen complained, but their pacifistic nature prevented them from fighting back. This continued on for months before the Otsen had had enough, and finally pulled out their wild card. The Otsen declared to the galaxy that they had a superweapon pointed at the Hendon's homeworld. If the Hendon did not stop their invasion, the Otsen would pull the trigger. At this, the Council sent a pair of Jedi to try and mediate between the two, but of course, the Hendon continued to ignore the Otsen, resulting in the negotiations going nowhere. However, at essentially the last moment, only a couple cycles from the Otsen committing genocide, the Jedi Knight and his Padawan discovered a crucial piece of information regarding the Hendon's culture that allowed them to peacefully resolve the situation. Can you guess what it was? 1 to 4 Meditate on it. Tara and Doran take a minute to think about it before Tara speaks up. It has something to do with that organ, right? Yes, you confirm. Did the Otsen have the force sensing organ? No. It's called the Fend, by the way. Means, guiding vein in the Hendon language. So, did the Hendon just think that all the Otsen were changers and decided to ignore them? No. If that were the case, they would have done the same to practically every other sentient they came across. Tara gave a little hum as she thought. Wait, this story was about the importance of culture studies, right? So is there some taboo for the Hendon regarding the Fend? You're on the right track, you say. They placed supreme importance on the Fend, regarding it as more important than their eyes. All the native fauna on their planet actually have a Fend, every single one using their sense of the Force to navigate. Which actually suggests that the Changer was not native to their planet in the first place. Is the answer related to Force sensitivity? Are the Otsen just unable to sense the Force? No, you say, shaking your head. It's been confirmed that the Otsen can produce Force sensitives. The only reason why there aren't any Otsen Jedi is that they are highly communal. Where one goes, at least a dozen others follow, which wouldn't be allowed in the temple. Also, their extreme biological needs for a specific atmosphere completely toxic to any other sentient would require a portion of the temple to be sectioned off and retrofitted with a life support system just for them. Sticking them in a has suit and giving them rebreathers like with Master PLO Kuhn wouldn't work either, as they habitually make skin-to-skin -skin contact with one another as often as possible. All right, I'm giving up, says Tara with a sigh. Doran, you have any ideas? At this, Doran, having been concentrating on his food, shakes his head. Zena, just tell us. Leading us to the answer like the masters do is all well and good, but I really don't feel like thinking anymore today. Maybe I should tell you two to meditate on it, you muse. Please, no. All right, fine. Jedi Knight Cern and his Padawan happened upon a strange Hendon just before the ultimatum came to a close.
This Hendon, unlike all of her kind, actually acknowledged the Otson's existence and seemed to be extremely concerned about the Otson's weapon. During their meeting, the Hendon revealed to CERN that the Hendon had a foundational belief related to the Force and the Fend. In their legends, monsters come from a world where the Force could not be felt, could not be seen. The world itself was not completely devoid of the Force, but for some reason, the Force was trapped within the planet itself. The sky was empty, the streaming auroras of Force that the Hendon used to find their way absent. Any creature, blessed with a Fend or not, that lives under such a blank sky, must be a demon. A monster, damned to a life of suffering, not knowing where it stood in the universe. The vast majority of planets that we know of are wrapped in the Force. Any Force-sensitive should be able to look up and see the flow of the Force around them and in the atmosphere. And, the Ots and Homeworld is no different. The Force flows through them, through their world, and through the atmosphere. But, there is one problem. The composition of the Otsen climate creates perpetual clouds that prevent a fend from seeing up into the upper atmosphere. Because of this, the Hendon thought that the Otsen must be monsters, completely deprived from being able to bask in the glow of the force in their atmosphere. They were demons, shadows in the corner of the eye, that must be ignored. The two Jedi quickly acted on this information, frantically racking their minds for some way to prove to the Hendon that the Otsen did indeed know of the force around their world. Eventually, the strange Hendon suggested that they use a creation myth of the Otsen which extensively listed observations a force-sensitive group of Otsen had made regarding what and where the force could be found, including in the atmosphere. The Hendon Collective, after being given this information, decided that the Otsen were simply unfortunate beings deprived of the atmospheric rivers of force, through no fault of their own. If their ancestors were once able to glimpse the force up there, then perhaps their species was not damned after all. They stopped their invasion and ended up paying reparations over the next decade. You conclude your story satisfied, having remembered all the facts correctly. You sit in silence with your friends while you finish your food, it having gone cold while you spoke. While the three of you move to return your tray and dishes, Doran asks, how could that Hendon have known about that myth? And why didn't she just bring it up with her own government? Well, you say, Knight Cern was asked that question too. For some reason, he seemed uncomfortable about it, trying to dodge the question whenever it came up. In one interview however, his Padawan mentioned one thing that confuses people to this day. The Hendon they spoke to didn't have any fend. After dinner, the initiates are released from their mandated classes for free time. Studies, meditation, and play are the most popular activities during this time. As such, you now have another chance to think about your dream. Force visions are a known quantity, not exactly common, but are a phenomenon historically experienced by Jedi. You've heard of incidents where a Jedi received some abstract vision in their sleep, leading them to come up with a new force technique give a life-saving warning, or spout some weird prophecy. Whatever it the vision was, it was generally something important and usually led to a big change in the Jedi's life. You are now wondering if what you saw was a force vision, telling you of something that is to come. If that is the case, then what could it mean? Force visions are almost always up to interpretation, so it's possible that it could mean practically anything. In your musings, you have been walking the wide halls of the temple, subconsciously heading toward the security offices. This isn't the usual kind of place for an initiate like yourself, but you have come here often enough just to chat with Master Masbo when you feel troubled. As you approach the offices, the air rings with an electronic chime, alerting the off-duty guards inside that they have a visitor. You stand outside the door, shifting your weight from foot to foot as you wait for them to go fetch Master Masbo knowing that you are likely there to see him. After a moment, Master Masbo opens the door and beckons you inside and into his personal office, where he takes a seat behind his blocky granite desk. The room is spartan, even more so than what could be expected of a Jedi. Very few personal effects adorn the room, only an ancient-looking clock and a small clay sculpture, made by you more than five years ago, sit on his desk. Everything else is purely utilitarian. You're always embarrassed to see the little gift sitting there. 
It's obviously not well made, but you're not sure you could do much better even now. Master Masbo refuses to get rid of it though, saying that he needs it to balance out the layout of his desk. Sitting cross-legged in the chair in front of the desk, it being uncomfortable to hang your two short legs off of it for long, you take a moment to center yourself before speaking. Master Masbo, I had a dream last night. A weird one. He raises an eyebrow in curiosity, repeating back to you, a weird one? A weird one. All right, let's hear it. I saw, a storm. A storm of colors and monsters. Close, or far? I, I don't really know. It seemed like it was, everywhere, all at once. It didn't really feel like a dream though. It felt, it felt different. He sits back in his chair, considering. Master Masbo, this felt different than all my other dreams. For once, I actually remember it all. Completely. I've been thinking about it all day, actually. It felt scary, as if the things I saw could potentially see me too. It even felt like something was about to notice me. Hmm, Master Masbo hums. Any interpretations? You think for a bit, then speak quietly. I've been thinking that it could be a force vision. A premonition. Maybe of a conflict, something soon to come. He closes his eyes, his forehead wrinkling as he thinks. Have you meditated on it? On what it could mean, that is? Allow the force to reveal more to you. I tried, you cry. But, I just keep thinking and thinking, going in circles. That's not what I meant. Don't think. Just, dive deeper in. Let the force take you to the meaning. Even if it doesn't, perhaps you'll find more information that will allow you to make better interpretations. Calming down, you say, I guess I haven't really tried that, going deeper into it. All right then. Would you like to try right now? I have some time. Nodding, you close your eyes. And let go. Master Masbo's voice is there, just at the edge of your hearing. There is no emotion, there is peace. You see an enormous storm of indescribable color, stretched upon an intergalactic scale. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. Horror and wonder and fear and joy and a million emotions flicker through you. This time, you force yourself to keep looking, but you feel as if you're missing something. There is no passion, there is serenity. Winding currents and protein gusts and unspeakable things with far too many teeth and eyes hurtle past. There is no chaos, there is harmony. You attempt to scream, and something's attention turns to. There is no death, there is the force. You choke back your scream and shrink in on yourself, making yourself as small as possible as the eyes sweep over you. A creature of mischief and madness swims past you, buffeting you in its wake. You roll over and over, spinning out of control. You dare not spread your limbs out to detumble lest you be spotted, instead waiting for your body to slow and stabilize in the viscosity of the Empyrean. After a few more moments, you untuck your head and stare out. And you see, nothing. Nothing. Where? Where is it? The light in the void, the beacon? Lost. We are lost. All is lost. Wait. No. You're being a fool. Of course you cannot see it. You cannot see at all. How can you see when you have not even opened your eye? One to five baleful gaze. You reach up to pull away the headband, but realize that it is already absent. Your eye is already exposed, and all you need to do is open it. And you do so. In an instant, all eyes turn toward you and the mouths of creatures innumerable snap open. Shrieks echo throughout the warp, stirring the muck of the Empyrean, revealing and waking a billion more nightmares. You spin in circles, casting your baleful gaze upon all your eye lands upon, monsters, demons. Shrinking back wherever you look. But, it is no use. There are too many. You have but one eye, and the monstrous tides of chaos are endless. In panic, you try to hide once again. You curl up, compressing your soul into an infinitesimal speck, then throw yourself into the abstract detritus of the warp. 
The creatures swarm around, mixing you into the mess, a speck of life in a slurry of warp stuff. You spin dizzily through the heterogeneous mixture, fighting back tears of confusion. And yet, you cannot get away. They are everywhere, eyes wide open and vigilant. You know that you must stay still, stay silent, for there is nothing you can do in a realm like this, you have no power here. Nothing. No hope. Only chance can save you now. You realize, with a start that in your panic, you have not closed your eye. It shines with a sliver of metaphysical light in this void. Despite the roiling colors of the warp, your gaze cannot be hidden, for it continuously carves a shallow, but noticeable trail, through the warp stuff. Quickly, you close your eye, just in time to avoid notice, from a feathered monstrosity, twisting its way past you. Or, you tried to close your eye. And, you tried to avoid notice. You did neither. In a moment, many fingered limbs, digits ending with claws, hooves, mouths, spiracles, and a thousand concepts unimaginable, reach out and trap you in a fleshy prison. The pulsating walls of the creature cage are impenetrable, even to your gaze. And suddenly, a hole opens. An arm moves slightly, revealing the tiniest gap in the prison's defenses. Not wasting this chance, you dive in, shrinking yourself even further and squeezing your way out. And once free, you find yourself in a cave. A cave with teeth. You panic, whipping around just in time to see the entrance seal shut. You slam yourself into the wall, right where you think it should have been to no avail. And then you feel movement behind you. Nine tongues emerge from the walls, spiked and dripping with vile mucus. Each one continuously shifts in form. Bigger, smaller, bloated, pink, blue, every form different from the others, and never the same as before. Screaming in fear and disgust, you try to run, to swim, to move in some way, any way, away from this nightmare. And you move. You finally move. You duck and weave, twisting your way around the tongues as they begin to move toward you. But where do you go? You are still trapped. You cannot keep this up forever. And with that thought, you are hit. A glancing blow from one of the tongues, having violently shot outwards, with intent to spear you. You roll with the blow, uncontrollably spinning away. The tongues try to track you as you move, but your path is unpredictable. The flow of the warp, even in the creature's mouth, continues to roil with the storm. A base creature of chaos cannot know where you will go but neither do you. All you can see however, is a blur as the blue and pink gum spin by, and you know it will be but a moment before you inevitably ram into a wall. Abruptly, the warp flows in a single direction, shunting you away. The blue and pink are gone, replaced with the familiar, and only slightly less terrifying view of the endless immaterium. As your spin slows, you see the creature that had encapsulated you in its maw now spewing out a storm of unidentifiable innards and bones. In a matter of seconds, the creature turns inside out, its belly imploding and swallowing the rest of itself, before being vomited out of its own mouth. As the remains of the creature fly off into the warp, they fracture, then shatter, then disintegrate into warp stuff. Soon, the creature is gone and all is clear. Except it is not. You are, elsewhere. The Empyrean is calmer than before, and the sea of monsters has disappeared. The creature must have kept moving while you were trapped within it, taking you away from, wherever you were. But you are still not alone. There is something floating there, not twenty meters away from you. A peaceful pale sun, warmth abundant, and oh so familiar. Rays of light spill outward, pushing back the corrupting influence of the warp. You bask in its glow, feeling safe at last. But it is fading, its surface vaporizing, as it burns through its energy. Light flickers, and all too soon it is gone. You are alone again. Floating. Your eye is still open, boring a tunnel through the warp wherever you look, but you know that for now you are safe. It will not be safe for long though, so without hesitation, you begin to close it. And then stop, for you feel something. Something is watching you. You look up, and through the clouds of the warp you see something in the distance. Three somethings, to be exact. Three immeasurably distant worlds in space. 
Three immensely powerful, massive storms of pure malevolent concept. So powerful that you now realize that what you felt is only the sliver of the attention of one of them. One of them. You turn away, shivering. You look down, and see your body fading into dust, and you know that your time here is coming to a pass. You are thankful for it, but then you realize something and whip your eyes around. You stare out into the abyss, heedless of drawing out even more monsters. But even now, with your eye open, you see no light. So with a sigh, you finally close your eye, and wait for the end. You hear screaming, a voice shouting in pain and endless rage. Your eyes snap open, but you can't see past the cloud of red blocking your view, and in your frustration you swipe at your own face. Pain lashes across your mind, and you roar in anger. In the back of your mind, you realize that the mindless, raging voice you heard was your own, yet all your realization does is make you even angrier. Strong hands grab onto your arms, and you thrash about, biting at the air and struggling to get your tail out from under you so you can make them pay. You can barely hear past the volume of your own voice, the beating of your own heart, the rushing of blood in your veins, and the thrum of the bloodlust in your mind. But, between the thud-thumping beats of your heart, you hear a soft voice pleading. Xena. Calm. Please, be calm. You are safe. Shu. You are safe. A soothing, cool feeling begins to flow through your body, the pain in your face lessens, and the fire in your mind starts to gutter. That's it, that's it. You're safe. You're safe. With a groan, you pitch backwards onto a soft surface, all the energy leaving your body. The soothing feeling continues to wash through you, clearing the aches away. You relax your muscles, close your eyes, and let go once again. Your eyes feel wet and your throat feels sore, as if you've been crying. You hear the soft rustling of fabric and muffled footsteps nearby. On your forehead, you can feel the reassuring weight of your headband still in place, despite its absence in your dream. The dream. It was a dream. Just a dream. Or was it? With a start, you open your eyes as you reach up to confirm that it is secure on your head. Still there. That was no dream. It felt so real. You knew things, words, and concepts that you could not possibly know. You swam in the sea of, something? The Empyrean, the Warp, the Immaterium. Filled with monsters. Demons. And you were looking for something. But you couldn't find it. Instead, something found you. Something ate you. But, you were saved. But by what? Whatever it was at the end that noticed you, it is absolutely not good. You know this with every fiber of your being. Even just thinking about it drives the force pooling within you into turmoil, as if you had. Wait. You see it. You can sense it. Inside of you. Why? Why can you see it now? Peering closer, you realize that at the edges of your senses, is haziness. Anything in the figurative peripherals of your force sense is clouded. And then, you notice, two more things. This foggy material is your true self, overlaid on top of the force. And, your third eye is open. Your headband slash eye patch is definitely there, you just checked, but you can see with it. But, it is not like your normal sight. When you look upon yourself with it, a layer of your true self seems to fade away, revealing rivers of the force flowing beneath. And within that, you can see something else. Something else flows through you, circulating through your body, and you recognize it. It is what you saw in your dreams, the warp. It streams through you, just like the force. Currents of the force and the warp intermingle, weaving together in a dizzying pattern. Blinking your third eye, your warp eye, you are fascinated as you observe the way your view of your true self changes. And then, you realize something else. The true self is related to the warp. Just as your gaze pierced through the layers of the warp, so does it pierce through the true self. And thus, the true self must also be made of warp stuff. But, no, that doesn't feel right. If that is the case, then why are you able to see more warp beneath? And why would the true self of anyone else be made of the warp?
when you look at a person's true self, it is first obscured by surface emotions of the person. Any person with force empathy can sense these emotions, but you have never heard of anybody else besides you being able to peel back these emotions to see the true self lying underneath. You thought that the true self was made up of the desires and the beliefs of a person. You have watched as the true selves of your fellow initiates built up over time as each child grew older. As a person changes from experience, so too does their personality and their true self. Why did you use to only see this? Why could you not see this intertwining of warp and the force in anybody else? You are hit once again with another thought. You were able to sense the force in others before. And you were able to sense other people's true selves. These are layers upon each other, but it was only obscured for your own body by the warp. How are you feeling, youngling? You are in the medical ward of the temple, lying on one of the patient beds. As you sat there having epiphanies, the on-duty nurse noticed you and walked over to check on you. You immediately direct your gaze at his true self, searching for the answer. And you find it. With your warp eye closed, you see his true self just as you used to. You ignore the cloud of emotions, looking into his true self and seeing his fatigue, his love for the temple, his concern for all the patients including you, and a thousand other things. Normal. Just as before. Blinking your eye open, you compare what you see with what you saw just now. Little difference. Except, you can see more depth in his true self. His fatigue lies on top of a mass of concepts, just above his concern for your health. You can see all his traits, layered upon one another like a sedimentary deposit, outlining his life, his soul. Probing with your force sense and watching with your warp eye, you can see the rivers of force winding their way through his body, just like with yours, though subtly different in texture and color. His is, lighter. Brighter and fuller than yours. Perhaps due to age and experience. Perhaps because you cannot see any strands of warp mixing in him at all. Turning your warp eye back upon yourself, you realize that the currents of warp seem to darken the force around them. Tainting it. Changing it. You begin to panic at this, before catching yourself and looking closer, trying to learn more. No, the warp is not affecting the force, you realize with relief. The streams of warp do not bleed between, merely overlaying it and shadowing it in sight. And, it is likely that your lack of age and experience mean that you simply cannot channel as much force within you as someone who appears to be at least twice your age. But then again, why are the individual strands of force within you so much darker than those within the nurse? Again, maybe it's due to age? Or, maybe, it's something else. Shaking yourself out of that train of thought, you come back to your original purpose. What is it that prevented you from seeing the force within you in the first place? It must be the warp, the strands of it, weaved in with the layers of your true self, built up over time to block your force sense from peering through. And you likely didn't notice when you were younger, as you were literally a baby. And, you didn't even have force sense yet. Xena. You're startled out of your thoughts, by Master Maspo's voice. You look around, wondering where he had come from, then flush with embarrassment. You had been so excited, so determined to accomplish your goal, that you had completely ignored what the nurse was saying. It seems the nurse, unnerved by your stare and not knowing what to do, had gone to get Master Maspo in order to shake you out of it. Yes, Master? He gives a small smile in relief. It's a good thing you're all right. I was getting really worried there. What happened to me? I, I meditated as you told me to. And, I think I found some answers. And questions. More questions. It worked? Ah, uh, we'll get to that later. Once you started meditating, you started mumbling a bit. Something about colors. It was only when your headband started glowing and you started screaming that I got worried. Sorry. Don't be. It's my fault. You're the one who got injured. You started bleeding from the waist and you collapsed shortly after that, so I immediately rushed you over here. I would like to know why my clock spontaneously rusted to pieces though. Uh. I don't know. Sorry. He sighs. 
it is whatever it is. We'll figure it out. Anyways, how are you feeling now? You also injured yourself quite a bit when you woke up. The medics had to use some Bacta to patch you back together. It hurts. A bit. My waist feels fine, but my face kind of hurts. That's where you scratched yourself in the face. When you woke up the first time, you were quite a handful. Most of the Bacta went to your waist, so that's probably why it feels all right. Your facial injuries are still a bit red though, so just keep your hands away from it for now. The medics will let you know when you're good to go. Understood, master. We'll talk later. Come find me after you're released so you can tell me what happened. 1-6 to six Discussing the Dream A massive, black ship drifts through the void between stars. Arches, towers, monoliths, and sculptures adorn the hull. The empty eyes of stone-carved skulls, larger than a cargo barge, gaze into the endless abyss. Dark windows flicker between columns, shadows passing behind darkening them even more so. Gut-wrenching, bone-chilling horror fills you as you look upon the ship, and you know not why. All you know is that it is coming for you. And you cannot hide. You awake with gasp, eyelids fluttering as you claw your way to wakefulness. Your skin feels sticky with sweat, your clothing, and the bedsheets damp. In a moment, the current on-duty nurse, a bith named Roncato Dasso, is beside you trying to calm you down. You curl up, waiting for the beating of your heart to slow, as she goes to fetch you some food and water. It was just a nightmare. An actual nightmare. Not like the dream you had a few days ago, thankfully. But, every night since then, you have been having nightmares. This is the second time you've dreamed of those black ships. Other times, you have dreamed of monsters devouring you. Two nights before last, you dreamt a dream of blood and rage, and when you woke up, you could barely think past the ringing echoes of cosmic laughter clouding your brain. You have been kept in the halls of healing for most of the past week, the medics and masters unsure of what to do with you. Your injuries have faded due to the ministrations of the medical staff but it is the events that landed you there that give the master's cause for concern. You have heard from the friends and clanmates that visited you that Master Masbo was questioned by the council regarding the incident. He told them what he knew, but as he was only really a spectator, he was cleared of any wrongdoing and sent back to his work. Given that you were the only one injured in your accident, it appears that there are not too many questions for you either. However, the people who know more detail regarding the extent of your injuries, Master Masbo first and foremost, are curious as to what truly happened. Over the past few days, you have been debating what to tell him. Obviously, you must tell him what you dreamt of. His interpretation of what happened could be invaluable. You knew things in the dream that you didn't know before. Namely, that what you were experiencing was something called the Warp. Or the Empyrean or the immaterium. You suppose that something so confusing, a realm of ever-changing concepts, does indeed deserve multiple names. Anyways, Master Masbo deserves to know what you saw. Hopefully, he can help you make sense of the monsters, the storms, and that light you were looking for. However, you have decided not to tell him about what you learned afterwards. To be honest to yourself, you're scared. What will happen if he learns that the warp is within you? What will he do? What will he say? You don't want to be different from the other initiates. You want to grow up and become a Padawan, a knight, a master. What would happen if the masters learned what your eye could do? Would you be prevented from taking the initiate trials? And so, you will keep quiet about it. What he doesn't know won't hurt him. You won't let it hurt anybody. A week after the incident, you are released from the purgatory of sterility, boredom, and hospital food. Immediately, you head over to Master Masbo's office to get it over with. Like before, you shift from foot to foot in front of the door, waiting for him to be found by the guards. And, as before, Master Masbo leads you into his office and directs you to sit. His desk really does seem imbalanced, you think idly. The lack of the clock makes the room seem even more empty than before, and the awful sculpture is worse than ever without something to take the attention off of it. You can just barely see the remains of the clock poking out from the side of the desk though. 
It appears as if he's been studying the thing, or perhaps just trying to repair it. Master Masbo is silent, considering you as you sit nervous with trepidation. How are you feeling? I'm fine, Master. Nothing hurts now. Good, good. Looks like your face didn't scar either. Anyways, let's get to business. I'd like to hear your account of what happened. You sit and think for a few moments, gathering your thoughts before you speak. I could still hear you for a little bit, when I started meditating, that is. It helped me get through to the dream, and as you asked me to, I dived deeper. It felt, it felt like I submerged myself in something, as if I had broken through some sort of membrane. And when I opened my eyes, I was somewhere else. Somewhere else? As if you had performed a force projection? No. No, it didn't feel like the force at all. I think it was different. Hmm, continue please. This, realm. This realm that I saw was like an ocean. It was filled with colors, concepts, and monsters. And the monster that I saw in my first dream, it was still there. Looking for me. It almost noticed me, but I was able to make myself smaller until it couldn't see me. At this, you notice that you have wrapped your arms around yourself, as if you could squeeze yourself until you were so small that you could avoid Master Masbo's judging gaze. You relax your hold, folding your hands into your lap, and continue. It left, and I felt safer. But, I was wrong. There were still monsters all around me, lying in wait in the dark. Hidden behind clouds of warp stuff and underneath the silt, just beyond my sight. Warp stuff? What is that? That ocean I saw, it's called the Warp. Or the Empyrean. The Immaterium. I don't know how or why, but I somehow just knew things. And I was panicking, looking for some sort of light. A beacon I knew should be somewhere in the distance. But it must have been so far away, because I couldn't see it at all. You sit back for a second, looking for his reaction. Master Maspo's emotions are primarily colored by dark green pools of concern and streaky blues of confusion. His true self is the same as before. You can't see more without opening your warp eye, but you dare not do it now, not while you're still telling your story. Carefully, avoiding the mention of your warp eye, you continue on. I messed up when I was looking around for it, and I started attracting the attention of all the monsters around me. They swarmed everywhere. Every way I turned, there were more, and they were all coming for me. I tried to get away, but I got caught by one of them. A huge, disgusting thing, with more arms, legs, tentacles, and whatever than I could count. It trapped me in its hands, things. I don't really know what it was that I was imprisoned in. There were fingers, hairs, and bits I couldn't recognize. I couldn't get out, but then it tricked me. It opened up a little hole, and I ran for it, thinking that it had made a mistake. Instead, I ended up just swimming into its mouth. At this the mild concern you can see in Master Maspo spikes, flooding and driving out his other feelings. Child, what happened? How did you escape? I don't really know. Inside the mouth, it had weird tentacle tongue things. With pointy bits. I think that's how I got hurt in the first place. I tried to dodge them as they tried to stab me, but I got hit right where you said I was injured. But, how is it possible that I could be hurt like that? It was all in my mind, right? I, I have no idea. I have never heard of this happening before. You're sure this didn't feel like the force? It wasn't the force. It was the warp. You're sure you're not mistaken? It's not a force vision, nor force projection? I'm sure, Master. Master Masbo is silent for a minute, obviously deep in thought. His emotions cycle across his true self, flaring bright and dimming as he thinks, I will have to consult the archives. Perhaps the answer can be found there. I have never heard of this warp either so I will have to enlist a librarian to assist me in the search. Ah, but you haven't finished yet. Please, continue. Yes, master. I'm not really sure what happened after that. After I got hit, I was spinning out of control and couldn't really see what happened. 
All I know is that suddenly, I was spat out of the monster's mouth, and the monster was dead. Dead? It broke into little pieces and disappeared. When I turned around though, I saw something else. Some sort of miniature sun. Not the light I was looking for earlier, but something else entirely. And for some reason, for some reason it felt like you. Master Maspo's emotions are painted over with the blues of confusion, before flaring yellow-green in understanding. Did you do something to me, Master, you inquire? I believe I did. Yes. When you started bleeding, I applied a force technique, called force stanch, to slow down the bleeding. How is it possible that that killed the monster? You think a bit more about what you saw, before saying, does the technique disinfect? Does it purge, corruption? I suppose that's one way of saying it. But, yes. It does. It promotes clotting as well as purifies the area, clearing out anything that could cause infection. That must be it, you declare, excitedly. The sun I saw, it was pushing away the warp. If the monster is part of the warp, then maybe it was destroyed by the technique. It wasn't a very powerful technique, though. The stronger techniques used in the halls of healing can actually heal wounds. This one only helps to stabilize injuries. How could it have even damaged whatever that monster was? Admittedly, I put in more energy than was probably necessary for the situation, but it still couldn't have been that strong. I don't really know, but could you try it again? I'd like to see what happens when you use it. Use it on what, though? I don't see any monsters around here, and you're not exactly injured anymore. 1 to 7, the rusted clock. Could you use it on your clock, you ask? What? Why? Um, before we get to that. Master, you mentioned earlier that my headband was glowing. Yes, I can't be sure why, but from the appearance of it, I would suspect that it was actually your, um, I, that was glowing. That's probably right. In my dream, my headband was gone, and I opened my eye. It just felt right to do so. But, maybe it was actually wrong, because that's what drew out all the monsters in the first place. My eye does something. When I looked at the monsters with it, most of them would try to avoid it. As if they were afraid of it. And, while looking around, it was like I was shooting an ion beam through water. Any loose warp stuff in front of me would disappear or be blown away. And there's more. It does stuff outside the dream too. Master Maspo stills, looking you in the eyes. Your normal eyes, that is. The ones that always glow. He's worried, extremely so. Master, I don't think it's dangerous. If anything, it's helpful. You used it for something? Already? I think it lets me see the warp. And, I think my ability to sense emotions is based around it too. But aren't you able to sense emotions without having your eye open? Or has it been open all this time? No, I've kept it closed, you deny. Maybe I'm wrong about that last thing, but I think something at least related to the eye or the warp lets me see emotions. You remember how I told you about the true self in the past? The psyche of anyone I look at? I couldn't find anybody with force empathy that could see it too. It must have something to do with all the warp stuff. And, when I look at anyone with my eye open, it lets me see even more. Xena. I know you think it's safe, but you need to be careful with it. Didn't you say that you attracted monsters with it? Master, it's not what attracted the monsters. The monsters were already there, just sleeping or hiding. I just didn't know what I was doing when I first used it, actually, I still don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm being careful. When I opened my eye that time, I stirred all the monsters up. It was just the wrong place for it, like turning on a lantern in the middle of a monster-infested cave and not expecting them to be angry. It was helpful though, for keeping the monsters back for a while. Master Maspo is, understandably, upset. He's confused, and definitely worried for you. But, he's certainly an expert at keeping his cool, given that he hasn't interrupted you yet. As he calms down a bit, you continue. As I was saying earlier, I'm able to see the warp with it. 
when I looked at myself with it, I could see warp within me. He's certainly good at keeping his cool, isn't he? Hearing that last tidbit caused a huge spike in his worry, but he's waiting for you to finish what you're saying. In a person's true self, I can see the force flowing. It's like rivers, lakes, and tributaries. The force flows through everybody, and with my third eye, my warp eye, I can finally see it within myself. Inside of me, the force flows just as smoothly as in anyone else, but between the rivers of force are currents of warp as well. Have you noticed anything different since the dream? No, no. What am I asking? It's not like you could see this before. Um, I do feel, kind of angry, for some reason. All the time. And I don't know why. I've also been having nightmares, but not the fell into the warp kind. Can we come back to this later? Sure, Master Maspo affirms. When I use my eye on someone else, I can see more to their true self. Where I used to see a... How do I say this? It's, it's like a painting. A flat canvas painted with aspects of a person's life. I could see what a person wants. I could sometimes see what they're hiding. But, it's two-dimensional. I couldn't see past the upper layer unless it's very thin. If they have something buried deep within them, I couldn't tell what it was. But now, with my eye open, I pick out all the layers. I can see what makes the person, and almost infer their past. And, like I said, I can see the force. Where I could only sense the force in others, with my normal force sense, I can now see it in another way. I think that the warp has existed within me, always. As I grew older, my own inner self was probably covered in the layers of my true self, which have been threaded through with warp stuff. Without my eye, I can't see the force deep within me, because the warp has buried it deep down and covers it completely. Now, I can see it all. As you take a second to breathe, Master Maspo sits up a bit. So, since you can see the warp, you want to try to see it inside the clock? And you're hoping that you can see how it reacts to the force stanch? You nod quickly in excitement, all eyes literally shining. I can see your eye is open, Xena. I'm assuming the headband isn't blocking your view, he trails off questioningly. You continue nodding, and he takes that for the confirmation that it is. All right then. Before we start, can I know what you see in me? Actually, you say you've looked at others with your eye before. What did you see? Actually, please use some discretion. Don't tell me anything too embarrassing. Your unwitting victims deserve at least a bit of privacy. Uh, I first looked at one of the nurses. I didn't catch his name, but he was the one who went to find you when I woke up that first time. I could see what he thought of himself, and I could tell that what he knew of himself was different from what was true of himself. Past his wants and needs are the, uh, foundational truths of the person. And, I could see for sure that he is a good nurse, and that he cares for his patients. But. But, he thinks he should be nervous and scared of things, just because that's what he thinks others would feel. And, paradoxically, para, parawatli? What's the word? Paradoxically. Paradoxically, he's so confident in himself, by which I mean he is so confident in his own thoughts, the belief that he should be nervous, that he ends up making himself nervous for no real reason. That's why he went off to get you rather than deal with me himself. He's competent otherwise. So, yeah. I can see these truths about him. What he can do and can't. And if he were to try to hide something, I could probably figure it out if I had enough context. What if you don't have enough context? I would be shooting in the dark. Guessing away. But, I knew he was a nurse, and just looking at his emotions for a bit made it easier to guess about some things. Well, now. That could be extremely useful for investigations. Do you think you could do the same with objects? Maybe do psychometry? Psychometry? Sense echo. Where you can experience the recent life of an object. See what it saw for a time. There is a force technique for this but maybe you can do the equivalent. I'm not sure. Objects don't have a true self for me to read. 
I guess I won't know until I try. Try it on Mr. Ears here. Mr. Ears? He gestures at the little sculpture on his desk. You suppose it kind of looks like some sort of rabbit creature with long floppy ears, but you're pretty sure your younger self was attempting to make a model of Master Masbo. You hope he doesn't know that. After a moment of concentration, you shake your head. There's something. A bit of the warp, but it feels like a layer of dust. Not much at all. As much dust as you could find on it if you didn't clean it for a couple weeks. I think it's from before, but it's only coating the surface. I can't read anything else out of it, only the warp stuff. That's unfortunate. Still, absolutely a useful ability. Who else did you try it on? Tara and Nine visited me a couple times. Doran and the others too, apparently. I was asleep for those visits though. Tara is, simpler than the nurse. Not in a bad way. She just has far fewer layers, probably because she's so much younger than him. She's pretty much exactly as she seems on the outside. Talkative and friendly. Earnest to a fault. Nine is a bit more complicated. She's afraid of failure. I think everybody's afraid to fail though. But, she's more, nuanced. She worries less about disappointing others, with failure, than disappointing herself. Except when it's certain people. You would think that she would be afraid of disappointing the masters or her friends. But, it varies. I couldn't really tell who affects her in that way. There's more to it, but I'd need more time to work it out myself, before talking about it. Master Maspo nods sagely at this, as if he already knew these things. Well, he has watched over you and your friends by extension, since you were a literal baby, so you can grant him that. I suppose it's my turn now. What do you see? You peer past his emotions and leaf through the layers of his true self. You catch a glimpse of the force within his inner self, but stay on task. You are attached. You are emotionally attached. To me and to your former Padawan. You care about everybody, the whole Jedi Order, the Masters, the Knights, and especially the younglings but you have linked your identity to protecting me and Knight Masa. It's almost, familial. That's enough, please. Master Masbo sighs. I suppose I asked for it, and it's good to know. But, you're sure this is the case? I know you well enough that I don't have to guess, Master. And, you don't have to ask me if it's true. You know it yourself, you're right. I can feel it. He closes his eyes. I can feel it in the force. A thread of connection. Thank you for telling me, Xena. But, not everybody has the strength to face the truth about themselves. You'll have to be careful before speaking to others like this. After all, how would you know I would be able to handle, ah, he cuts himself off. Of course. You could see that in my true self couldn't you? That, and I know you well enough. Yes, yes. Master Masbo sighs and give you a bit of a pleading look. Xena, please try to keep that to yourself. My attachment, that is. I'd rather Master Dralig not strip me of my position. You nod at this. Temple guards are supposed to avoid emotional attachment as much as possible, hence the anonymous white robes and masks. The fact that Master Masbo allows you to see his face while in his office is a huge measure of trust. While off-duty, Master Masbo does go around without guard attire, but he treats it as if he were undercover, with a separate identity. Of course, you can still easily tell who he is when he's on duty, either by voice, presence in the force, emotional signature, or true self, but it's the principle of the thing. Xena, you saw the force and the warp within you with your true sight. Did you see anything else? No, master. I was distracted by everything that was going on. Perhaps you should try it. Seems like the ultimate tool for introspective meditation, really. Anyways, we should get on with what we were doing. At this, he picks up the pieces of the rusted clock, placing them gently in front of you. Right after you started screaming, this thing started rusting over. Any metallic parts tarnished to the point that some completely turned to dust. 
Nearly all the steel screws are gone now, which is why the whole thing fell apart. The brass gears are mostly still there though, but the zinc content is lower than before. Go ahead with your examination. Tell me what you see. As you turn your gaze upon the clock, you speak out loud, narrating what you find. The clock as a whole is clearly tainted by the warp. The warp moves sluggishly throughout the various pieces, as if impeded by the material. It wisps away at the edges, threading its way through the air for a moment, before vanishing. The clock was likely even more tainted in the past, but the warp has been evaporating over time. Hopefully, it doesn't do anything once evaporated, but you think it should probably be isolated away from people and you say as much. Peering closer, you see a sudden flash. A flash of, memory. You see a brief moment, frozen in time, of a girl with three glowing stars in her head and screaming in fear and pain. You can smell the faint scent of blood and hear the ticking of the now-broken clock. In an instant, the sensations pass, and you're back to reality. You try to probe the clock again with your gaze, but nothing else comes from it. You excitedly confirm to Master Mass Bo that it appears that you do in fact have a very limited FORM of psychometry. You can see a moment from when it became tainted, but it's probably not possible to see any more than that. You do however see, as you continue to observe the pieces, that wisps of warp that fall away from the clock seem to move toward you. You stand and walk around the desk, watching as the strands of warp stuff continue to point in your general direction, just like how a compass would point to the north. It seems that not only can you see what tainted the thing, but it's likely that you can track down whoever, or whatever, caused it in the first place. Or maybe not. Maybe you're acting like a magnet, brought too close to a compass, simply attracting the needle in what resembles a useful direction. It's impossible to test this hypothesis though, as you're the only thing that you know of that could cause warp taint to appear. You're unable to find anything else to the clock and so you end your investigation. Master Masbo moves forward, saying, I'm not entirely sure that this will do anything. Typically, Force Stanch needs a living target to work. I've not heard of anybody trying to channel it into an inanimate object, so it may not even take. Even so, Master Masbo continues with the task, placing his hand on the most tainted piece of the clock that you direct him to. After a moment, you can feel with your Force Sense a moment of calm. Serenity. The Force flows through him as you watch with both your Warp Eye and your Force Sense, pulling in his hand for but a second. The tiniest bit of force leaves his hand, injecting itself into the clock and you are confused. Why did he channel so much of the force when so little of it is used? But then, you realize that, no, the rest of it is not wasted. He is manipulating the force within the clock itself to do what is needed, using the force within him as some sort of control medium. Very little force exists within the clock however, making the work slow going but you can see that something is indeed happening. Where the force stanch goes, the warp is pushed back. And when the force stanch is able to touch the warp, you can see the warp stuff being slowly, obliterated. No. That's not the right word. It's banished. It leaves the materium, forced, or more accurately, forced, back to the immaterium. You excitedly fidget in your seat as Master Masbo finishes unwilling to distract him while he finishes the force stanch. Once done, though, you describe your new findings, barely intelligible, due to how fast you're trying to force the words out of your mouth. As you calm down and sit back in your seat, Master Masbo wraps the pieces of the clock in pieces of paper before storing them away in a wall safe. Hopefully, the warp stuff will dissipate over time with no ill effect. Well, I believe that we've learned quite a bit from that exercise. But, it still doesn't answer the question as to how Force Stanch could kill a monster within the Immaterium. If it is only able to slowly force warp stuff back into the warp, why is it so much more powerful inside the realm of warp? And, what was happening inside the warp while I was using it on the clock just now? Perhaps I was killing horrors, left and right, without knowing it. I don't really know, Master. But, I'm guessing that it was a special case when you used it on me. I was experiencing the warp at the time. Maybe I was even partially in the immaterium. 
Using the force stanch on me probably helped channel it into the immaterium, making it much more powerful. You're probably not, smiting any monsters when you use it normally. Hmm, that's probably a reasonable conclusion. The two of you sit in silent contemplation for a minute. You've certainly learned a lot, and hopefully you can make good use of this information. After another minute of thinking, you speak up. Master, could you teach me force stanch? It'd be really helpful. Of course. Come find me around this time tomorrow, and we can get started. It may be a bit challenging for you to learn though, since it's a technique typically taught to Padawan's level learners. But, I have full confidence that you'll be able to learn it. Thank you, Master, you say with appreciation. Zena, you mentioned that you were feeling angry earlier. Do you still feel angry now? Um, you think for a moment. Yes. I can feel it humming in the back of my mind. It is, suppressed. But, it's not really just anger. There's a bit of fear too. I can't really explain it. I think it's related to my nightmares too. Zena, that sounds dangerously like the dark side. You remember what Grandmaster Yoda always says. Fear leads to on. I know. I know. But, I think this is at least partially because of my warp dream. I think that this is something you should try that enhanced introspective meditation on. You should aim to identify the problem, then eliminate it as best as possible. Yes, Master. You're very good about controlling yourself, Zena. You've been holding back your fear and anger admirably. You're doing far better than I would have at your age. Zena, I'm very proud of you. And with that, the dam cracks. The frightfulness of the past week hits you at this moment. The dreams. The nightmares. The pain. The fact that you almost died to something that might have only been in your mind. You'd been keeping it all suppressed, pushed to the back of your mind, but Master Masbo's words strike within you and loosen your precarious hold. The tears spring forth as you hunch yourself in the chair. You wail and bawl your fears out, as Master Masbo scoops you up and into his arms. But, I am scared. Scared of what is happening to me. Why? Why is this all happening to me? It hurt so much, and I almost died. You take a moment to breathe, before continuing to choke out between sobs, the monsters. I see them in my nightmares, hick. And my other nightmares. There's blood and slaughter and endless death. And I'm afraid. Afraid that it's me who's doing the killing. I wish I didn't have this eye. If, if I were normal, then this wouldn't have happened. No warp. No monsters. No nightmares. Master Masbo keeps holding you, patting your back gently as you try to calm yourself. Zena, child, breathe, he says. Do not fear. You are strong. It is only natural to be scared of something like this. I would be scared, too, if I were in your shoes. But, I know you will get through this. And, I will always be here to help you. You don't trust yourself to not continue sobbing if you open your mouth. So instead, you bury your face into his shoulder and nod. You're calming down now, having expelled your frustrations. Embarrassment fills you as you think about how he had just told you that you were good at controlling your fears, and then you immediately went on to cry like a baby. You're much too old to cry. You wipe off your face, the tears having slowed. You then look up into Master Masbo's face with bleary eyes as he speaks. Hush, now. Everything will be all right. Thank you for telling me everything, Zena. I will help you to the best of my ability. Just trust in me. We should probably head to the archive soon. But, before we go, is there anything else? After thinking for a bit, you decide to tell him one last thing. What you didn't tell him when he asked you to inspect his true self is what makes you speak further. Master Masbo cares for you. A lot far more than a Jedi should. It's almost like he considers himself a father to you, not that you know what a paternal figure is like. But, this feels like the right descriptor. Attachment is a gray area for the Jedi. It's obviously expected that Jedi will care deeply for one another. 
master and apprentices. A brotherhood. A sisterhood. A family, but not a true family. There must be some level of detachment from one another for the Jedi to do Jedi things. Or, at least this is what the masters say about the topic. You're not entirely sure if this is correct, but who are you to question your elders? Master Masbo, however, clearly cares more than he should. If you, or his former Padawan, A.C.I. Bakatwa Masa, were to perish, you're not sure what he would do, but it would certainly not be adherent to the Jedi Code. However, it is because of how much he cares, and how much trust he has for you, so clear within him that you could not possibly mistake it for something else, that he feels absolutely distraught with his inability to help you beyond teaching you force techniques like force stanch and telling you to just meditate. And so, you speak up one more time. Master, there was one more thing I saw. At this, Master Masbo pauses, then gestures for you to continue. Just before I woke up, I looked around again and I saw something else. I saw three really really big storms in the distance. They looked tiny at first, but for some reason, I just knew that they weren't small, but actually just far away. And they felt, evil. Pure evil. And one of them noticed me. A storm noticed you? Yes. I think they're sentient and very powerful. This is, disturbing indeed. Another thing we must search for in the archives. Hopefully Master New is there. She'll likely know where to look this up. With that, Master Masbo stands, adjusting his robes, and donning his guardian mask. As the two of you move, you can hear him muttering softly, slightly muffled by the mask, but still intelligible. A great evil. Watching. The Jedi Temple Library houses the records and knowledge of thousands of generations of Jedi. It is an old and sacred place, headed by the master archivist Jocasta New, and holds an austere beauty that never fails to catch your eye. Rows upon rows of brilliant blue hollow books and data tapes line the countless shelves, guarded by the scowling busts of past Jedi champions. The archive custodians are clearly fastidious in their work. Not even a hint of dust or patina mars the faces of these centuries-old statues. Its arched ceiling is inlaid with patterns in ancient script, which you can barely see from your position on the archive's main floor, so far below. A mezzanine level above hosts yet more tantalizing books, which your fingers itch to get a hold of. You have been here many a time for your studies, and thus are familiar with a good portion of the archives. However, it's not like you were researching ancient evils and esoteric magical realms of immaterial demons. Thus, you try to keep up with Master Masbo's strides as he makes his way to the chief librarian rather than running off to search by yourself. Of course, Master New's services are always in demand, so the two of you have to wait in a short line for several minutes before she is available. In the meantime, you look around, observing the wandering knights and younglings as they navigate the library. Wandering among the patrons of the library are junior archivists, learning the trade as they assist in the maintenance of the library. A good portion of the relatively small EDU core makes its home within the Jedi Temple, and you could swear that the majority of those that are here make their homes within the archives itself. A group of scholars and historians, they are the keepers of the knowledge of the Jedi Order and are invaluable to the Order as a whole. The thought of joining them does have some merit. After all, you do enjoy your studies quite a bit. And it isn't as if the librarians are slouches in combat either. Although you would no longer have access to a lightsaber as part of the service corps, you are still able-bodied and trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Additionally, your propensity for an aggressive style of fighting would, ironically, be welcomed here in the library. After all, the librarians believe there is no such thing as being overzealous in the protection of their precious books. Ahem, the protection of irreplaceable knowledge, that is. You shake yourself out of your thoughts as Master Masbo steps forward, pulling you along by the hand. You find the chief librarian, Jocasta Nu peering down with a trace of amusement in her smile. Evidently, she's taken note of your interest in the archives and the EDU core members, and certainly approves. A budding little librarian, I see. How can I help the two of you? Master Masbo, taking the lead, begins to inform her of your purpose here. 
Master Nu, Initiate Xena here has been having, dreams, maybe visions, of an unusual realm, called the Warp. Xena, what else did you call it? The Empyrean, Master. Or the Immaterium. Yes, the Empyrean. As you may have heard, Xena landed herself in the infirmary during a meditation session that I led her through. She was in the midst of some sort of vision, in which she was injured by a massive creature. In her vision, she was struck just about here, Master Masbo gestures toward the approximate area on his own body, and she actually began bleeding, right there in my office. I used force stanch to stop her bleeding while I took her to the halls of healing, and it seemed to somehow affect her vision as well. As in, the energy of the force stanch banished the creature that was hurting her. My goodness! I do not believe I've heard of this warp before. And if it is the immaterium, then I suppose that there is a materium? Yes, Master Nu, you say. The immaterium was what I saw in the vision. The real world, where we exist, here, this is the materium. And these terms came to you in the vision? Yes, Master Nu. Hmm. As I said, I've never heard of this before. Least of all, I've never heard of actually being injured from a force vision. Was there anything else to the vision? At this, Master Masbo clarifies, Master knew, Xena was not having a force vision. She was unable to feel any trace of the force until I performed the force stanch. Xena, please correct me if I'm wrong. You nod in confirmation, and Master Nu frowns in thought. You continue on, filling the gaps that Master Masbo left in the account. Master knew, just before the vision ended, I was noticed by something. Something big, and definitely evil. I can kind of feel it in the back of my mind sometimes, watching and waiting. As if I were a little fish in a fish tank, and it's waiting for me to do something interesting before it does anything more. At this, the librarian frowns even more. All traces of her earlier amusement have been wiped away by this story. It's good that she's taking you seriously, but you are starting to get scared that by revealing all this, Someone's going to take you to task for making trouble and drag you in front of one of the Jedi Councils. Master Nu makes her way around her desk and motions for the two of you to follow. One of the archivist droid steps in for her in the meantime, and you suppress a pang of fear as you follow her and Master Masbo away. The three of you walk the halls of the library, heading deeper and deeper into the archive. You are far past the areas you've been before, your studies as a mere initiate not requiring much more than access to the area just within view of the help desk. As you walk, you try to gather your thoughts. You have quite a few questions you need answered, starting with, what is the Empyrean? While you were in there, you knew things you shouldn't have known. And for some reason, your vision self continuously described things as being composed of warp stuff or pure concept. Very descriptive, very helpful. Unfortunately, Master Masbo was unable to help you make sense of almost anything, other than what turned out to be the energy from Force Stanch. But that turns into more questions. Why is warp stuff corruptive? Why can Force Stanch cleanse this kind of corruption? How was it able to kill such a disturbing monster as the one that almost claimed your soul? And of course, what was it that noticed you in the end? Hopefully, the archives can shed some light on this but given that neither of the two masters had any knowledge regarding the warp, you are starting to have doubts. This is the holocron vault. The greatest, one to eight passing the time. Master Masbo, as a Jedi Temple guard, is an excellent swordsman. He spends the majority of his time keeping watch over the entrances to the temple, but another critical part of his work is tracking down and stopping rogue Jedi. Any Jedi who has fallen to the dark side will certainly have to watch out with Master Masbo after them. Perhaps, he'll be willing to pass on some of his knowledge of lightsaber combat? Chasing after gun-toting raiders is one thing. Dueling a saber-wielding opponent is another thing entirely. If there's anybody who can give you pointers, it will be Master Masbo. You know for sure that this is the case since he's already helped you out immensely with Adaru in the past. And so, you decide to bother him while you wait for the chief librarian to finish her own search. Master, you say, avoiding saying his name in public, since he's technically on duty with his mask on. 
When's the next time you'll be teaching us? In physical training? I'm not sure. The instructors haven't asked me to help out since the last time. Why do you ask? I want to get better at fighting, you exclaim. I'm smaller and weaker than the others, so I need to get better or I won't be able to keep up. I won't be able to beat anybody in the tournament, otherwise. Learning to fight just so you can fight more in the tournament isn't the goal, little one, admonishes the master. You pout at this, turning your eyes up toward him. That won't work on me, you know. I know you well enough, Xena. You've already gotten past that hesitance of yours in combat. Ever since you started learning Adder you've become very good for your age. You don't need me in order to do well in physical training. It's all about self-discipline anyways. It's on you to make yourself better. But, you always have the best tips for me, you whine. It's because you know me so well that you can help me best. Also, I've had to fight monsters already. It's dangerous. If you help me, I could be much safer. Xena, would being stronger or better at dueling help at all with fighting dream monsters? Maybe. You don't know it won't. You didn't even have a lightsaber in your warp dream. I didn't have a lightsaber on me when I started meditating. Maybe it'd have come with me if I did. The gathering's only a couple months away too. I'll have a lightsaber soon. Master Mass bow sighs and looks away. You can see the emotions swirling around him as well as the needs and desires in turmoil within his true self, the care he has for you warring with his sense of duty. Finally, after a minute, he sighs, and then looks back at you. Xena, you don't need me to teach you how to fight, I think it will be a better use of your time to focus on learning force stench or meditating on how to deal with that anger within you. If you're asking me to tutor you in dueling, I can give you some tips, but I'm not your master and you are not my padawan. I cannot spend the time to tutor you specifically in combat. But, you are still my teacher, you say quietly. Master Masbo frowns at this, his emotions in turmoil once again. After another moment, he makes a final decision. Fine. I will give you a few lessons. But, only when we both have the time. Just as I said, I want you to focus on Force Stanch and your meditation. You don't need to be a good duelist to be a good Jedi. Take your time with it. Yes, Master. You glance at the door to the holocron vault, and seeing that it is still closed, you turn back to Master Masbo. Master, do you have any tips that could help me now? It could be helpful for the gathering. I heard it can be dangerous there, you say. Master Masbo hesitates for a moment, then decides to oblige you. All parts of your body are a weapon. Especially that tail of yours. It's been growing sharper over the last few years, and I'm starting to get worried that you'll accidentally stab someone with it. I'm being careful, you protest. I'll hold you to that. I don't have a massive scorpion tail myself, so I can't really help you with how to fight with that thing but I can tell you more about using the rest of your body to your advantage. Through Adaru, you've learned how to use the available space around you, using your speed and agility to engage your opponent from any direction. Keep your opponent from tracking you properly, and hit them from where they least expect it, either with your lightsaber or with anything else. Punch them in the gut. Kick them. Knee them. Elbows work too. Anything you can do to get the advantage is on the table in a real fight. Mixing in strikes between swings of your blade can catch many opponents off guard. Headbutting? I would recommend against that unless you have no choice. If you don't do it right, you can hurt yourself just as badly as you hurt your opponent. Or even worse. The horns might help you in a pinch, but they're too short to fully prevent you from hurting yourself. You think a bit as Master Masbo finishes his lecture. You've heard the majority of this advice before, but hearing it from Master Masbo drives the point home. Honestly, a lot of it sounds pretty obvious anyway. However, you believe this will help you out in your future fights. You're not sure if it's allowed in the lightsaber tournament though, is identical to, is identical to, is identical to, is identical to. A minute later, the door to the vault spirals open with a whoosh, making you jump up in surprise. Jocasta New steps out, 
The dark violet of worry mixed in amongst streaky blues of confusion evident in her emotions. You can't really tell what exactly she's found, but it's probably bad news. As Master New steps closer, she begins to relay what she found. Which was, nothing. Nothing at all that matches your circumstances. Nothing mentioning the warp, the empyrean, or the immaterium. Nothing about gargantuan creatures like you saw. And nothing regarding being injured by a vision. There's plenty of similar stories among the holocrons, but everything is clearly the result of dark side shenanigans. What you said about being watched by some malevolent force was also far too vague to be useful. She relays multiple accounts of Jedi who experienced some distant evil watching them and manipulating their actions, but again, nothing matches up. Due to how imprecise your description was in the first place, you get the feeling that perhaps you wasted Master News time. Fortunately, she's rather understanding about the ordeal, despite the fact that you're sounding more and more like a child complaining about some scary dreams. Don't worry, dear. We'll get to the bottom of this yet. Do you feel as if you are in any immediate danger? When you shake your head in denial, she smiles kindly and continues. Well then. You're likely to be fine. I'll bring this up with the council the next chance I get. Perhaps another master has heard of this issue before. In the meantime, continue with your initiate training. If anything happens, anything whatsoever, immediately let me or your master here know. Thank you, Master New. I will. Good. Unfortunately, it may take a while before I can bring this to the council. Recently, there have been many issues cropping up. Distasteful petty politics. Nothing for you to be concerned of, but these things do get in the way. Now, I must be off. The guests and my books call to me. And with that, Master New departs, gliding her way back to the front of the library. You turn as you hear Master Maspo speak. Zena, as Master New said, please be careful. I will always be here for you, but I can't always be there for you. You must come find me as soon as something happens. Or, better yet, don't poke at anything even seemingly dangerous unless I'm around. I will trust your judgment here. Yes, Master. Well, it's time that we are off too. I have duties to return to, and you need to return to your classes. I believe that you can at least catch the end of today's physical training session if you hurry. Yes, Master. And, thank you. Thanks for being there for me. I'll be safe. One to nine making progress. I think I feel something, Master. Keep concentrating. You are definitely getting there. It's feeling, closer. Heavier. What? Um. I think I need to pee. Can I go? Yes. As you head off to the nearest fresher, you think about the last few weeks of work. You've spent little time socializing with your friends during your free time or studying for your classes. Instead, you spent your time learning for stanch. Either Master Masbo or one of his friends devotes his time to your education. Days have been flying by as you concentrate on the task, but the more you learn, the harder it seems to get. The force flows. You can sense it. You can see it. This should be easy, especially after watching Master Masbo perform force stanch a dozen times. You know for sure that you have made progress. At first, you could barely muster the force under your will, only able to gather bare wisps of it into the appropriate location, aiming to pull as much as possible into your hand so that you can properly manipulate external force to stanch a wound. After the first week, however, you could finally noticeably differentiate what you were doing from your weak telekinesis ability. By the end of the second week, you could sense blood beginning to clot within seconds of application. However, you are still unable to get your force stanch to perform its corruption, cleansing function. The last couple weeks have been the worst. Every time you think you are getting somewhere, you fall short. Perhaps, it is your lack of ability to conceptualize the result properly that hinders you. After all, all you can see is the result as a force stanch cleanses a wound. You are still unable to figure out what exactly it is doing, either to infectious agents or to warp stuff. 
but you cannot give up. As frustrating as your lack of progress in the last two weeks has been, you just know that it will be worth it. You are already almost there after just one month of study. You just know you will get there. All initiates are required to meditate at least five times a day. You're not really sure what actually counts as a time, though. If you meditate for 10 minutes, stand up and stretch, then sit back down for more meditation, does that count as two sessions of meditation? Or does it just count as one? Some of your fellow initiates follow the letter of the law and claim that the first of these two ideas is technically correct. Lazy. You, on the other hand, understand that it's more the spirit of the matter and try to follow the latter of the two interpretations. Of course, you aren't always able to keep this up. After all, who really has time for five whole sessions of meditation every day? Not you. You've got stuff to learn. Cosmic Secrets to Unlock So, if you do four sessions of meditation a day instead of the mandatory five, then who's to blame you? It's not like any of the masters are going to keep track of your sessions anyways. Also, sleeping is like meditation too, and sometimes meditation is like sleeping, but you don't tell anyone about that, so on days when you can only do four, you know you actually did five. And on days you do five, you actually did six. So it's fine if you slack off occasionally. Even better, you've stopped having nightmares so you can get some proper sleep, deep meditation. No more dreaming about monsters in an endless abyss. No more black ships of pure dread. And no more dreams of horrifying, joyful slaughter. But, one thing still itches you. The anger. It is still there. You can feel it lurking in your thoughts, ready to spring out. But you won't let it. Every other session of meditation you've had, you've flipped open your warp eye and turned it inwards. And when you do, you see yourself for who you truly are. You observe your emotions. You see them change as you react to seeing your emotions change. A fascinating little spectacle of colors and synesthetic concepts. But you're not here for your surface emotions, so you detach yourself from them and let them drift away. Diving deeper is your true self, which you leaf through, layer by layer. You see the buried emotions. You see the traits that make you you. You see the memories of your past life in the temple as layers of feeling mixed with vague threads of concept, just enough to grasp and get a glimpse into. And among it all, you sort through the laminate of warp stuff that is cemented within, perhaps one day you could remove it, but you're not sure you need to. While it does block your force sense from reaching within yourself, you have a perfectly good way of sensing within yourself as you now know well enough. And, to your inexpert opinion, it does look kind of pretty, like a series of ley lines spreading through your being, lighting you up from within and nicely contrasted against the constantly flowing rivers of force. And, deeper down, where the force softly whispers as it winds its way in spirals and settles in peaceful pools, is your inner self. Your soul, as a small part of your mind calls it. The true self of your true self. This is where your identity rests. And this is where your inquisition begins. The anger you feel must be somewhere around here. If not here, then in the layers of your true self. You will find it. You will examine it. And then you will dissect it as you figure out how to drive it out. But, this search will be slow. Slow and steady. You cannot afford to make mistakes. You're not sure if you can hurt or change yourself while poking around in here but it's better safe than sorry. And so, you've taken your time. You've taken your time over the past month sifting through your soul, and you have yet to find anything. But again, this is something you will not give up on, not until you've hunted it down. Despite being cooped up in the meditation rooms or Master Maspo's office between initiate studies, it is impossible to miss the biggest, hottest news that's rocked Coruscant in the last decade. Well, actually, you did miss it, but what with everybody talking about it in your classes, and in your shared room while you're trying to sleep, you're quickly caught up. While you were injured, a former Jedi named Dooku had laid down a scathing tirade against the Galactic Republic, declaring it to be corrupt to the core, and founded a treasonous separatist state called the Confederacy of Independent Systems. You don't exactly know what to think about this, 
but you're not exactly surprised. Oh, you are certainly alarmed to learn that a fallen Jedi has taken command of a certainly hostile state, but you can't say you didn't see the rest of this coming. In all your readings of recent political events, you've been noticing a significant trend within the Republic. A bloated bureaucracy. Widespread corruption. Megacorporations gaining power. And most significantly, a consolidation of both political and economic power within the core worlds, while the outer rim has been growing poorer and poorer. Well, the last statement isn't exactly true. Overall, it hasn't decreased in wealth. But, the wealth disparity between the outer rim and the core worlds has been growing larger at an ever-increasing rate. In a galaxy of supposed peace and prosperity, the worlds of the outer rim have been getting the shit end of the stick. Wherever you go, you can always hear discussions, to the effect of, what are we going to do? But, what can we do? What can the Jedi Order do? What should the Jedi Order do? The Jedi Order isn't supposed to be involved in politics. But people are suffering. But we should not interfere. And then there's fighting. Usually, it's just verbal arguments. But, more and more you hear of arguments devolving into fistfights, and all you can think to yourself is that this is getting worse, where even is Sereno? You look up at Tara as she speaks. You and your clanmates are all eating together at the moment, a rare sight as you've been rushing through the majority of your meals in order to just get a bit more meditation or practice with force stanch in. But, today, you've decided to take it a bit easier. You keep quiet, not knowing the answer, and focusing on your food. Her question is directed to the group in general though, so after a moment, one of your more learned clanmates speaks up. It's in the Dastan sector. Thanks, Yolan. Now, where's the Dastan sector? In the Northern Dependencies. And where's that? In the Outer Rim. Very helpful. Why don't you just look at a map? Ah, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter anyways. I just want to know why this dicky guy is some sort of count. I thought he's an ex-Jedi. How'd he become nobility? Dooku, you correct her. Yep. That's what I said. Sure. So why is he nobility? A count is some sort of title, right? And those are hereditary? How Dooku know that he's a count? It's not like we're exactly told about where we came from. Doran looks up from his own meal, spraying crumbs, as he says, I heard that he just wasn't taken at birth. He left his family and joined up with the Jedi Order by himself. Are you sure? I heard he was abandoned by his family, then saved by the Order, says Yolan. You're not really sure yourself, but you do feel a bit envious. Not really about the whole situation obviously, but it would be nice to know where exactly you came from. You're not even sure what you are, according to the various genetic tests that were performed on you while you were too little to remember, you're not exactly human. You have a lot of similar DNA to a human, but there's certainly some ridiculous amount of mutation within your DNA, just considering your exterior appearance. It's possible that you're some sort of genetic experience by a mad scientist, but it's also possible that you're some sort of offshoot of human and could be classified as an entirely different species. So, he's just always known that he's a count? I'd sure like to know something like that. What, so you can make us bow to you whenever you come near? No. Well, that would be nice. But, I dunno. It would be nice to know where I came from. Not that I'd leave the order just for that, though. If anything, you should be the one who's bowing. You're practically halfway there. Or at least, you wouldn't have to go that much lower than you already. Hey. R. Anyway, even if I did know where I came from, I don't think I'd want to be anywhere else. A few minutes of awkward silence passes, the only noises being that of the clinking of silverware, the quiet chewing of young initiates, not all of which know how to chew with their mouths closed yet and a few quiet yelps as Tara flicks food at Doran in childish rage. Once out of ammunition, Tara turns to you again. So. Xena. Are you going to be doing anything tomorrow? Um. The same as today? How about we do something fun? 
Like what? I'm not sure I have much time. Tara glances back at the others, before looking back at you. The sour grain of nervousness clouds her emotions, but you're not really sure why. Please? We could just, hang out. And play. Something. Or we could just study or something? Together? We don't really get to see you much outside of classes and meals, so you should really do something with us. And you're cooped up all the time, so you should get some air or, something. Air, okay? One to ten surprised. Where are we going? Secret. You let Tara drag you around the hallways of the Jedi Temple, winding your way around columns, through empty rooms and atriums, and past wandering knights and masters. You're well and truly lost at the moment. Tara has led you far past your usual haunts. Far away from the areas a youngling would normally be seen. Left turns. Right turns. Up and down flights of stairs that you would swear haven't been traversed in years, given the centimeters of dust coating them, if it weren't for the clearly visible footprints of feet only slightly larger than yours. The Jedi Temple is a labyrinthian building, the biggest and most complex of any structure within kilometers. You don't think that anybody could possibly have explored the entirety of it, other than Grandmaster Yoda of course. It would take decades to see every inch of the place, and only one person could possibly have had enough spare time over their lifetime to do so. Though, if Yoda did do so, it must have been many an age ago, when the temple was much smaller and he could move much quicker. You're tempted to use your warp eye to try and figure out what Tara is up to. Her hand grips you as if she fears that you would run away if she were to let go, not that you would know where to go next if you were suddenly freed. But, you've decided that if she's so excited, you can clearly see that, even if without your warp eye, and probably even without your normal eyes, you might as well go along with whatever dastardly prank she has in store with you. You don't really have it in you to ruin the surprise, unless the surprise involves leaving you to find your way out of this place, that is. You can hear the slight hubbub of conversation ahead of you as Tara pulls you around another corner. Light pours out of a single room at the far end of the corridor and you rush to keep up as Tara breaks into a jog. We're almost there. Gah. I almost fell. Slow down. Fortunately, Tara's legs aren't that much longer than yours, so you're able to catch yourself and increase your gait before Tara's constant tugging causes you to trip. A few seconds of jogging later, you hear the voices quiet down as you near. You strain your ears to hear past the rushing of blood in your veins, your heart pumping slightly harder from the unexpected exercise. What are they planning? A pie to the face? A roll of clear tape across the doorframe? You prepare yourself, muscles tensing in preparation for any ambush. But, you can't see anything out of place, other than you and Tara in an otherwise empty hallway. And you can't hear any treacherous plans afoot. Perhaps it is safe. Boo. Aya. You instantly lash out, planting your foot into Mix family jewels while you swipe Tara's feet out from under her with your tail. The two of them are groaning and blubbering in pain by the time you get up. You step over Mix prone form, leaving Tara clutching at her tailbone as you enter the doorway. As you cross the threshold, the first thing you see as your eyes adjust to the light are the rest of your clan gathered around a table. Most of them are staring at you in shocked silence, but you can clearly see a few barely holding in their laughter. Not funny. Oh, ha. Oh, but it, ha ha, but it is. Ha ha ha. And there they go. Now everybody except for you is curled up on the floor, either in debilitating amusement or crippling pain. All right, all right. That's enough. What even is this? After a moment, you walk toward the table, your clanmates unable to explain themselves. The table is, strange. It's covered in candles, the only light source in the room. Foreign, looping iconography adorns the surface of the table. Shrouded containers are piled on one side, and something sits on what looks like an offering stand, but covered in a metal dome. The smell of smoke and melting wax pervades the room, drawing out, indistinct memories. Fragments of something that you feel like you should really remember. Something important. 
something like, a ritual. A ritual. A yearly ritual. Oh no. Not this again. You reach out, ripping the dome off the platter and revealing the source of this stupid event. A cake. A sweet little cake, decorated to the best of all the collective ability a group of 10 to 11-year-olds have. It's, wonderful. Sorry Mick. Tara. I'm okay. Oh, it's not even my birthday, though. Or my abandonment day. After a few wheezing breaths, Doran heaves himself up from the ground, admirably holding back his laughter. The kitchen staff had some leftover cake from a birthday party they held for a cook, so they let us have it. And, your, uh, abandonment day already passed and we didn't even get the chance to celebrate since you were always busy. And, it's not like you were born on that day either. Then shouldn't we have had this party earlier? It's not like I was born after I was left at the temple. We didn't have a cake then. That makes perfect sense to you, so you just nod. You do appreciate the gesture. You all do your best to celebrate for one another. It's just happenstance that everybody's birthdays are clustered around the other end of the year from yours. Although, it is perhaps a bit sad that you didn't get a full cake. It's, probably stale, leftovers from someone else's birthday, but you're not going to let that stop you from enjoying it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for doing all this for me. I love it. And with that you're, kind of, one year older, ten years old. At least in the minds of your friends. Your family. The only family you need. You're probably much older than that though. Probably at the very least a whole three months older, according to your caretaker. You're almost old enough to become an apprentice. Just another year and nine months. You'll get your lightsaber in a month, then you'll prepare for the initiate trials. And, after you ace them, you'll impress a master, maybe Master Mass Bo, at the lightsaber tournament and become the best Padawan ever. As you eat your cake with your now recovered friends, you chat and enjoy the event. Tara and Nine apparently found this place while exploring a few weeks back, and they just thought it would be as good a place as any to throw you your part. You're a bit concerned that the masters might be wandering around looking for you within the next hour until Yolan whispers into your ear, informing you that he'd already gotten permission from your caretaker to come here. Just don't tell anyone else, or they'll think he's a little snitch. And so, you eat. You have fun. You open your presents, finding small trinkets you might enjoy. You, relax, 